This is a relay project. Real Talk starts right now. Here's Ryan Jesperson. Well, a good December 22nd morning to you. It's Thursday, and this is our final, do we say front-facing show of the year. That intro, special holiday intro put together by the intrepid genius, John Hicks, the technical producer of this (laughs) show. Lucky to have you, pal. Very well done. I like the mix there. Yeah, we should have used this for the whole month. What was I thinking? Yeah, who knows? Well, we could maybe we'll listen to it uh, in early January until people tell us as as we approach February that like it's time to take down the trees and stop playing the holiday. Yeah, I was going to wonder when you were opting to take down all this festive flair. Yeah, we'll see. Well, not anytime soon. Uh, (laughs) Tomorrow, of course, Friday, December twenty third, will be our annual uh, Patreon exclusive holiday party by Zoom. It's a an annual tradition. This is the third annual. uh, The real talk that are uh, amazing in the sense that they support us on a monthly basis via our Patreon. You can go to our website, uh, ryanjesperson.com. You click on Connect, and then you can find out what's involved with with Patreon. We'll be hanging out with them tomorrow morning. We're going to have a great time. Mm -hmm. We're going to sip on some mimosas. We've got some special guests. We're going to do some cool giveaways. It's it's one of the things we do to say thank you to our Real Talk patrons. And it's not too late to sign up, by the way. If you want to be part of that exclusive party tomorrow, 8.30 Mountain Time, same deal, but super casual. Uh, You can check out the website under the Connect link. Uh, Sean Canugo joins me in studio in 15, 20 minutes time an innovation strategist and sean's been recognized for his dynamic keynote speeches this guy lights a fire under people and we thought that it might be great timing as we approach a new year i don't have to lay out where people's head space goes in the new year some of you are already like sapria devetti and i in in yesterday's episode of seriously uh, our podcast our weekly podcast together the title of yesterday's show f u 2022 some people are ready to close the book on this year some people 2022 has been a banger it's been unbelievable and they want to keep that momentum going into 2023 some of you are dealing with personal tragedy tough times some of you feel like you're riding a wave I feel like everybody's going to take something from our conversation with Sean today but we lead uh, with some of the best investigative uh, journalism in the country. Robin Doolittle, with Investigations with the Globe and Mail, has been covering the story of the Hockey Canada scandal for months. And just a short time ago this week, an update as court filings revealed new details about the alleged Hockey Canada group sexual assault. Robin, kind enough to join us from Toronto this morning. Thank you for making time for us, and happy holidays to you, my friend. Yeah, same to you. Yeah, what we knew about this story ahead of time, ahead of your report, uh, up until earlier this week, it was was largely based or almost exclusively based on a, a statement of claim uh, from the alleged survivor, the victim in this case, known as E.M. Uh, and then, of course, new details emerge. Can you lay this out for people that aren't familiar with the story, Robin? Sure. So the story that we published on the weekend is based on a document that we obtained. Uh, it was filed in court by the London Police Service. And in that court application, London police were asking a judge to approve a series of investigative measures, mainly warrants and production orders. And in the course of that document and asking this this judge to approve these these requests, they lay out their findings or or many of their findings uh, from their investigation into the alleged group sexual assault that occurred in the early morning hours on June 19th. Uh, 2018 involving members of the World Junior Hockey Team after this big Hockey Canada fundraising gala. So there were some, uh, I think, big new revelations in this report. As you mentioned previously, all that we had was the statement of claim that was filed by EM earlier this year. Um, So this new document includes summaries of the police interview that EM gave uh, police. It includes summaries of interviews that the players gave to police. Um, And it includes some other details that the police found. Namely, so you have to remember, they did an investigation back in 2018 that closed in early 2019. 
something new that's happened is in this new investigation, which was opened in the summer, police discovered uh, the existence of a group text message chat between the players. So there are references to messages that the players sent that night. Um, one that stood out. Uh, so EM and player one, as he's identified, have consensual sex in, in a hotel room after going out to a bar and meeting at this bar. And it's alleged in this document that when they finished, player one texted as she went to the bathroom, texted teammates to come to the hotel room. One of the players described getting a text uh, that says, you know, player one says, if anyone wants, um, and then it's redacted, sex act, uh, come to my hotel room, and someone wrote back yes. So this existence of the group chat, it also discusses um, this kind of mysterious, as EM describes him, a well-dressed older gentleman that is at the bar that night prior to the hotel room that's buying the group drinks. He's alleged to kind of poured a shot down EM's, you know, into EM's mouth and uh, says to her like, oh, player one, he's the greatest. You know, he's praising him and says, you know, take care of him. Um, and then the the other big thing uh, is the uh, it, it describes the player one learning about the police investigation from someone at Hockey Canada prior to the police getting in touch with him, which seems to contradict some things that Hockey Canada have said about whether they knew the identities of the players. And finally, it says that the police believe they have reasonable grounds to charge as many as five players uh, in this incident. That doesn't mean they're going to. Um, the this evidence has not been tested in court and no charges have been laid yet, but that is the state of play at this moment. Yeah, and so this obviously hockey fans, and we're not going to do it here, and I know you wouldn't do it with the credibility you have, and frankly, none of us are looking to get sued, but the hockey world is a buzz right now. Everybody's trying to figure out, a lot of people think they know who player one is. People are speculating about who this well-dressed older gentleman is. There are some outrageous suggestions about who it might be, and there are some that, that kind of make sense here. Of course, if charges are laid in this circumstance this is this is all going to go public is, is there any way of knowing robin what may come next in this story is as, as, as literally millions of people are trying to figure it out i have no idea uh for based on any you know concrete information that i have what i would say is there are some clues um in the police investigation they say one the reason that they need these production orders. So the, the big thing that they asked for was Hockey Canada has commissioned this independent investigation into the events of that night. Um, this is being done by a lawyer named Daniel Robitaille uh, at Heenan Hutchinson Law Firm. And they have applied for access to the fruits of that investigation. I'm using that language, even though it's kind of weird because that's what's included in the in the document. Um, so they want all those notes. They want the interviews. And they say that what they want to do is compare what the players may have said to her um, uh, or given to her against what they've said to them. So that's an indication to me of things kind of moving towards closure because they have their investigation done. And now they're kind of crossing T's, dotting I's, seeing, OK, are, is, is there you know other evidentiary issues who, here? Are there contradictions that we need to look at? Um, they also want access to this group chat. So lawyers representing four of the players provided police with this group chat on on thumb drives. Um, but for you know court procedural reasons, evidentiary reasons, the police have not read those messages yet. They've just been hearing about them from players through interviews, and they want um, they want uh, the ability to see those messages themselves. And again, I think this goes back to, to to confirm is what players are saying to them correct. So I think that that is an indication of of whether of, of where we're at. I think it's quite far along, you would guess, based on this document. Yeah, we're talking to Robin Doolittle. If you're just joining us, investigative journalist uh, with The Globe and Mail. Um, as you report, uh, you know, I mean, the, the, the Hockey Canada reached a settlement with, with EM without consulting the players that were involved mm -hmm. or, or allegedly involved. Involved. And, and of course, um, reporting, your reporting, TSN's reporting and others uh, it prompted, uh, obviously, a, an, an appearance in front of a parliamentary committee this summer in June. Hockey Canada there to, to explain its actions. It's, it's, it's touched off a firestorm of controversy uh, across the country. It's had implications in the highest levels of leadership when it comes to hockey. And, and then... Is if I need to tell you, Robin, in, in five days from now, in four days from now, a whole bunch of Canadians 
uh, that are you know around the world going to be observing what's been a family tradition for a lot of years are, are, are probably going to go to their closets. I, I guess I'm describing where my head's at, and they're going to look at these Hockey Canada sweaters that are hanging there, and the World Junior Tournament's going to be set to kick off, and and some people are going to go, ah, I'm going to focus on the hockey, and they're going to wear the sweater, and, and some people are going to say, forget this. Uh, they're not going to watch this year, and then a whole bunch of people are going to be torn. I mean, what does this do? In particular, this new information, do you think, to the reputation of, of Hockey Canada already absolutely marred this year? It's tough. I think there is some questions in this in this new document that we are continuing to report on again about Hockey Canada's actions in the immediate aftermath of this. This idea that perhaps they, you know, gave the player a heads up or that the player was alerted about this prior to the police investigation. And, and I didn't mention this, but it's significant because what's alleged to have happened is, so this happens June 19, the early morning hours, this, this, this alleged assault, um, the, the player or the uh, complainant's mother, you know, finds her very upset. Uh, I won't get it. It's, you know, you can read the piece. It's quite upsetting. Yeah. Um, she calls police. The player's mother's husband then is alleged to have contacted someone at Hockey Canada and provided that person at Hockey Canada with a photo of player one that the complainant found on Facebook because the bar posted photos. I, I shouldn't say it says on Facebook. That's where I believe it is from. It's that she finds a photo of, of this person from the night at the bar. Um, and at that point, the player is alleged to have searched her out on Instagram and started messaging her to drop, like, did you go to police? Like make this go away, which is quite significant. Um, so yeah, there's some scrutiny about what Hockey Canada was doing in the immediate aftermath of this. Yesterday, I did an interview with um, CBC's The Current and Hugh Frazier, the new chair of Hockey Canada was on right before me. And I thought his interview was very telling. At one point, Matt Galloway asked the new chair, you know, is there a toxic culture problem in hockey? And he seemed very reluctant to say that there was. He, he kind of says, I'm paraphrasing, but something to the effect of, you know, we're as a society, we're grappling with a lot of these issues and we're working through them. And I just thought that was really telling because this is the new person that's coming in, just elected over the weekend, has an opportunity to kind of draw a line like this is the before, this is the after as we're moving on and seems reluctant to do that. And I, yeah, I think this is going to be more problems for Hockey Canada on how you know, they're handling this whole thing. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just speaking candidly, I think that the sense of people on the street, I don't speak for 35 million people, but, but I think the sense the majority of people feels that Hockey Canada was uh, involved in this, notifying Player One. Uh, we don't know if they offered counsel or not. They were maintaining funds. These these And, and the, even the name of the funds. I know you're the journalist, Robin. You're not going to sit here and take strong opinion positions, but I can say... The National even, Equity Fund. The National yeah, Equity Fund. If I read about the National Equity Fund, I think that that's allowing um, that's that's ensuring that young people of color that girls that people in marginalized communities that people with disabilities that's where that money's going uh, to provide equitable access to sport not to settle sexual assault allegations right I mean I know I'm yeah, stating my the colleague obvious Grant Robertson reported on that 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 they had kept this separate fund to resolve sexual assault complaints which is not I want to say inherently a bad thing to set aside money for people who, you know, to, to make sure that they, they are able to receive compensation for a lot of sexual assault complainants that they're not looking necessarily for a, a trial, but they, they need, they want something to make themselves feel whole and to kind of move on and receive counseling or compensation, et cetera. So that is not inherently bad. I think, as you pointed out, there's been questions raised about the name of this fund that it seemed to be, as my colleague has reported, that, that you didn't have to involve your insurance companies. You didn't have to disclose this. And through a lot of the report reporting that I've done, I think that there's been calls on, on companies at large that if you if you do these settlements, which are not inherently bad, I want to be clear, but you should have to be transparent. You know, we received a complaint of, of X, Y, and Z, and we've resolved it. And these are the measures we've taken to address the concerns. Like that that element of transparency, I think, is is what's really missing here. Were we able to achieve any clarity, uh, Robin? And as you mentioned, London police, an investigation opened and then closed. And then 
reopened. Uh, mm -hmm. you, as you report it, you know, at this point, they discover a group text message. I'm not a police officer, certainly. I don't know what it's like, but I, I would imagine, I don't know if I'm investigating an alleged group sexual assault. I might check people's phones or I might check phone records. I mean, it, it strikes me as though, and I don't have the background information. Maybe you do. Was the investigation, is is, is there evidence or, or, or is there common sense involved here that suggests that maybe the investigation wasn't taken seriously in the first place or, or perhaps wasn't as fulsome as it should? Have been considering the table stakes here? Uh, what I can say is from reading this latest document, it appears that in the first investigation, they the they did not uh, they were not aware of this group text message chat. So for whatever reason, that was not discovered. They also didn't interview MM from the bar, uh, the the older the older gentleman. Um, in this, in the latest uh, investigation, they say that MM doesn't recall uh, much about the bar that night. Um, but so that's an example of, you know, four years later, what does someone recall? And that to me was a telling detail as someone who's looked into how police handle sex assault cases is, are you, especially with like, you know, the whole world wasn't paying attention to it at that time, but this is your, you know, world junior hockey team in town. And this allegation, it's obviously very serious. London, Ontario, uh, you know, I'm from around there. It is a hockey town. I mean, there was, there must have been an appreciation that this would be a big deal at that time. So I, I don't have any insight into, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the officer's rationale for why they did not lay charges in 2019 uh, is redacted. So I don't know what their rationale was, mm. um, but I think that you've highlighted some some things that also caught my eye when I was reading this. Well, your, your reporting's remarkable uh, on an ongoing basis. People can check it out at theglobeandmail.com. Hey, I also appreciate it on a side note. I, 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 yesterday, I know that you were getting a lot of flack, or you have been this week, from people that are complaining that your stories are behind a paywall. And, and yeah. I just wanted, I, I appreciated that you pushed back. You did it with class. But I always want to, if we hey, have man. an opportunity, if yeah, well, I mean it. And if we have an and and this show, you should know, subscribes to the Globe and Mail proudly, along with like ten other outlets. And uh, we we believe that that journalism like yours is imperative and incredibly important. And and I just want to say, I understand that that times are tough for some people and money can be tight. But I don't know who people think pays the journalists and keeps the lights on and keeps the websites going. I'm not sure why people think everything should be free. I appreciated you pushing back. Yeah, thanks. I get it. Like, I want to, if, if your listeners are going like, what are you talking about? Basically, our story, Globe and Mail, we, we charge people to read us. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that sounds like such a basic comment, but, um, and so the, the story is behind what, you know, a paywall, you have to pay to read it and, uh, or subscribe to read it. And there's a lot of pushback on that. People that this kind of thing should be free. And I want to be clear. I get it. I get it. Paywalls are frustrating. I hit paywalls all the time. I read a lot of news across the world. And if I encounter a place that's won the subscription, you know, I do my little thing. I try to go around the paywall and find little <laughs> sure. avenues. And if I can't, then I have to move on or I have to subscribe. And I get it. It's frustrating, but it is really difficult to, you know, the, the um, newspapers obviously need to operate and we need subscribers. Like a story like this, uh, this story was months, months in the making to try to get this document to try to get the sourcing on it. There's a reason no one else had it, that this was alerted to, uh, to me by, by, um, by source that takes a long time, right? Like that work takes a long time. There were lawyers involved, like it's expensive stuff. And so we can't do this without subscribers. So I know it's irritating. Feel free to complain about it. I get it. But, um, but that is that is what I was pushing back against. I appreciate uh, <laughs> you you being on board with this. Well, I just, it just feels to me like it's just obvious. And uh, and uh, anyway, we're we're proud to support the Globe and Mail, Canada's national paper. Um, and and obviously, you're one of their stars, Robin. We wish you a very happy holiday season. Thanks for being yeah, available to us here on Real Talk. Anytime. Happy okay. holidays, everybody. Yeah, you bet. Yeah, give Robin a follow on on Twitter at Robin Doolittle, and of course, you can check out her piece at theglobeandmail.com. Thanks to everybody. Like you know, this show doesn't happen. Uh, like I've said as well, without the Patreon support of so many of you, and then of course. 
with a whole bunch of you showing our sponsors love. Like, quite frankly, if this show didn't have sponsors, there wouldn't be a show tomorrow and there wouldn't be a show on January 3rd and there there wouldn't be any more shows uh, because, uh, you know, uh, well, do I have to say why? No, because because there are expenses and this is what people do for a living. And like Robin said, you want these big investigative pieces that blow the doors off massive institutions. You know, I've, I saw somebody claiming um, and, uh, you know, it was it was sort of like one of the usual suspects on, on Twitter, you know, the sort of like forward facing futurist, the guy that the, like Elon Musk is his hero and, and, and all the rest of us are plebs and fools suggesting that journalism will die in the next five years and citizen journalism will take over. And there is something remarkable about social media, the capabilities to spread and share and, and dissect information. But citizen journalism doesn't blow the doors off stories taking on institutions like Hockey Canada or the Catholic Church. And allegations unfounded, unproven, unsustainable, shared on social media by anonymous accounts with no accountability, don't fly. And there will always be a place for responsible, reputable, long-form journalism like what Robin and her team are doing for talk shows like we're producing here and for all of the other people that are doing incredible work. I almost feel like off the top of my head I want to sit here and talk about the, all of the, the media outlets that we support. There's so many. you got to pick and choose, obviously. But many local ones here. I think of the Sprawl down in Calgary doing an incredible job. We're proud to support them. Uh, we support the Post Media Papers, Calgary Herald and, and Edmonton Journal, the Globe and Mail, the National Post, the, the Washington Post, the New York Times. We subscribe to magazines, Alberta Views, Edify. We encourage you to check those out local magazines in our neck of the woods that are doing great work. And I know that I'm forgetting others, but the point is with better journalism and with storytellers that are able to do what they do professionally and to sustain a career, the better off we are, the more real talk we can have. Why not stuff a subscription to a favorite outlet into somebody's stocking this year? What a cool idea that is. Our little guy, Wyatt, just found out from his grandparents that he's got a subscription to Chickadee Ooh. that's going to start in January. You remember Chickadee? Of course, so he's, of course. He's yeah, going yeah. to get the crossword puzzles <laughs> and the word searches and all that kind of cool stuff. Hey, speaking of our sponsors, I want to give a special shout out to our friends at California Closets today. They sponsor our Mixler audio live stream from 8.30 to 9.45-ish Mountain Time every day. And, and of course, you know California Closets is making better living in every room. You can create a custom closet for your space, style, and budget like my wife Carrie and I did at californiaclosets.ca. But here's the thing. In the new year, we're going to start showing you their whole new game, their new jam, baby. California Closets is in the garage game. If you have one of those garages and it's just basically what the builder gave you it's not insulated there's no shelving stuff's all over the floor what a great time to check out californiaclosets.ca and ask them what they could do for your garage if your budget's modest or massive they'll blow your mind with the options they have at californiaclosets.ca hey speaking of big builds and successful projects what about this studio hey in edmonton's historic mercer warehouse this was the team at complete care restoration that made this dream a reality for us now this is probably the only sponsor of ours that hopes that you never have to call them but if your place is damaged by fire or smoke or flood if your plumber discovers mold if your renovator discovers asbestos that's when complete care restoration comes in you can check out their services and why they've earned the trust of the insurance companies and the clients that they've dealt with for many years at CompleteCareRestoration.ca. Don't forget, if you're navigating a nightmare with your insurance company, you have the right to choose who does the work. With two thumbs up, we recommend Complete Care Restoration. Now, I know many of you, like me, are probably realizing there's a couple things you haven't ticked off your list yet, right? As you head into the holiday weekend, one of those might be a host gift or something to show up to a party with or something fun for the kids after Christmas dinner. Why not make it a Dairy Queen plan? Enjoy layers of celebration with a DQ cake from the Dairy Queens of Northwest Edmonton and Sherwood Park. No matter if you're celebrating Christmas, Kwanzaa, Hanukkah, Festivus, airing of grievances coming up, by the way, in about an hour from now, The Dairy Queens and Palisades, Nemeo, Newcastle, Westmount, and Baseline Road can customize a cake for you. You make sure you let them know you're there because you heard about them on Real Talk. We want to send a very special happy holiday greeting to our friends at Eden Landscaping. 
I was joking with Mike, the owner, that everybody thinks once the snow falls, all the landscapers kick off their boots, put their feet up, and sip hot chocolate for six months. That's not the case. Mike's busy designing outdoor spaces through the winter months, so he and his crews can bring them to life in the spring once the ground thaws. If you're thinking of maybe a custom install, like an outdoor kitchen, maybe a beautiful water feature, now's the perfect time to go to landscapeedmonton.ca. Ask for Mike family-owned for more than 20 years. You know, oftentimes an interview will come about on this show because we'll, we'll see something online or one of you, a real talker, will put something on our radar and we'll go, we can work with this. And that's the case with our next guest. He'll be our final live guest of our 2022 calendar year here in studio. And it was this tweet, quote, I keep thinking how we are more interconnected than ever before, yet we have never misunderstood each other more. That from Sean Canungo, a globally recognized innovation strategist for more than a decade. He worked at Deloitte, working with leaders to better plan for opportunities associated with disruptive innovation. Forbes has called him one of the best virtual keynote speakers they've ever seen. His content on innovation through his fantastic YouTube page has garnered millions of views, and he's just released a best-selling book, The Bold Ones, with McGraw-Hill, Unpacking the DNA of Disruptors. So cool to have Sean Canungo with us in studio. Welcome. Hey, it's such a pleasure to be here. What an honor being the last person of the calendar year. And I thought to myself, listen, it's minus 45 outside. Literally. And Christmas is around the corner. I thought, what a great... Time. What a great opportunity to uh, to celebrate a little bit. So guess what I brought? Oh, the, the Canadian <laughs> the, the the Canadian drink of choice during Christmas is Bailey's, and I'm gonna pour a little bit from for you and oh. John, and we're gonna enjoy this. We're John, gonna, are you down? We, we, are you into this? And while I pour <laughs> I'll, this, I'll drink yeah, gasoline. While I pour this, <laughs> listen. It's so cold. While out. while I pour this this bad boy for you. Oh, wow. Um, um, I just want to say, I'm going to pour some for you too, John. Um, Ryan, tell me, wait, what are you grateful for this Christmas? Well, I'm going to get some. Uh, oh, my goodness. Look at this. He's, he's getting up. This guy is a veteran. First of all, John, you understand why I was here at 5 o'clock crushing coffees because I knew that we were going to have to have the energy to keep up with Sean Canungo this morning, right? Like this guy just. I like this guy. This, 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 this is the guy that like, I feel like, Sean, you're the, you're the guy that like when the airplane comes in for the landing and then the tires first hit the tarmac and it's just like, whammo. <laughs> it's like, let's go. That's what it's like to talk to you. What am I grateful for this holiday? season yes i'm grateful that we have a happy healthy six-month-old baby boy uh there is a, si a seven-year window between our two uh absolute blessings wyatt and noah and while i'm grateful for my entire family obviously i can say two things uh, on the opposite sides the bookends will be a six-month-old and a 73 year old so so little noah is blowing our mind and we're thrilled to have him and my dad uh, i want to say this and i think he might be watching right now um my dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's several years ago mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, a devastating diagnosis for anybody whose family has been through it. And I'm really grateful. We spent some time with him a while back and I looked over and my dad was talking to his older brother and he was holding a glass of wine without a tremor. And, uh, and sure, there are worse days than others, but I am so I mean, if it sounds like a weird word to use, but post-diagnosis, I'm so thrilled that that knock on wood, it, it appears to be one of those things where like it's a classic could be worse situation. So off the top of my head, love it. Without knowing you were going to ask me that, those are the two things I'm grateful for. What about you, John? Come on, me. Uh, I'm grateful for uh, this show that I was explaining my story uh, to Sean when I got here. It's you know from DJ to radio guy to producing commercials behind the scenes on radio and then learning video and event production. And then all those roads kind of, isn't that how life is, Ryan? They all kind of intersect. And then yeah, an you old and me friend of mine gives me a call one day and says, hey. You and me working at the Oilers for many yeah. years together with no, uh, you know, Johnny and I worked together for yeah. a long time. Like I, I'd mm -hmm. be down on the ice being a clown and <laughs> uh, and I'd be like, and that's the end of this promotion. Then I'd, up, I'd go up to you infamous yeah. and then Johnny would hit it with the big tune. And, but, but so I'm, We I'm, had no idea. Yeah. So I'm grateful for, for learning new things. Like I never believed in fate and kind of, you know, destiny before. And now I, I think in the last eight, six, six, eight months here, I've kind of. 
come into that fold. And also, of course, my beautiful wife, Jatinder, and our, our lovely little dog, Priscilla, who they said would not survive, was a runt of a litter. Yeah. And shoot. basically, we said, hey, can we come get this dog? They're like, you can, but it's, you know, so it's what- sickly. And it's still here. So miracles happen. Destiny's awesome. And uh, happy New Year, guys. Amazing, Johnny. I, listen, on, <laughs> on that note, I just we got some, we got some alcohol in our cups. I just want to make a toast because what you guys have been doing over the last year, growing this this show, um, you have been the uh, the 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 cornerstone of media in Edmonton and 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 beyond, and you've been producing some unbelievable content. So, um, on behalf of all the real talkers out there, I want to. I want to thank you. So, wow, man. Cheers, well, here, thank here, you here, very here. Much. That's very All kind right. of you to say. Cheers, Johnny. Cheers. Now, of course, you're not, um, you know, you, you, you swap roles with host very quickly when you take <laughs> command of a show. But I cannot let it pass without asking you what you're grateful for this holiday season. Well, you know, I actually am grateful for uh, the fact that we are expanding our family. We're, we're having a, our third kid in February. And everyone is healthy and happy. And it's just been an unbelievable year for myself. I have a Another baby, which is this book, The yeah. Bold Ones, that's come out. And to be honest with you, it's my first book, my debut book. And I had no idea about the publishing industry. I didn't know how it worked. And it's just been unbelievable to see people grab the book, you know, all around North America, around the world, sharing the book, sharing the insights. And I'm just grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm literally every single day, I'm just grateful for that. Uh, the the idea that people are reading this and consuming it and and loving it. So okay, so I want to I want to I want to talk to you about that. We'll get into the yeah. book and let people know that, uh, especially now that there's Bailey's in the mugs, that this is going to be. I, I said to you before, you're the you're the last guest of 2020. I mean, we got a couple special guests on the Patreon special tomorrow, right. but but you're the last in studio. You're the final guest. You're going to send us into the holiday season. Um, and I said, so why don't we take like a relaxed, conversational approach? To this why why don't we kind of chill out? And so we'll take our time and find some different angles. Were you always like this? <laughs> were you, were, when you were in grade three, in grade five, in grade nine, in grade two, like, were you always the guy that was like, what's up? And it's a great day to be alive. And people are like, fucking Sean, <laughs> I'm, I'm dragging my feet today. I'm not, it's minus 45. I don't want to be here. And you were always finding silver linings. Was that always you? I think just, I, you know, for me, it was just in pockets, um, you know, being with certain groups of friends, you know, certain groups of, of friends would really um, get that, that that humor and that energy out of me and, and certain groups I would be a little bit more quiet so I knew my role but um, I think I found my voice in in high school I was in a group of geeks and I said listen somebody's got to stand out here so um, so that, you know that's I think where I found my voice and just working in the business world just differentiate yourself actually you know being from Edmonton I always felt that you needed to stand out you needed to be bold and um, I just wanted to be my authentic self, which is somebody with energy and mm. passion and and you know charisma and being able to share that with the world is, is something that has differentiated me. And and I and I I'm grateful for that. So for the ki- for the kids right now that are like wearing braces and wearing glasses, and I'll, I'm wearing glasses right now, and I wore braces. I don't know about you, your teeth are perfect. John and I, by the <laughs> way, are going to ask you for grooming <laughs> tips later. The we skin promise. Routine. We want to know. We want to know, know skin, skin routine. routine. We want to know the hair product you use. Um, but but that that group of geeks, your friend, the group of geeks are, are they all like executive directors and ceos right now they, well they, you know they, they've done very well for yeah. themselves and That's they take the very traditional routes and <laughs> oh, is that uh, right doctors and lawyers you know i have a lot of east indians that's when you're south asian you have a lot of doctors and lawyers and uh, accountants this is so. what sapria devetti tells us yes. her, her parents were devastated when she said she was going into broadcasting and not law but we, yeah we've had some fun with it so let's get back to this tweet yes uh because this this actually did i mean it, it, it took it accomplished what i think you were probably hoping it would accomplish it, it prompted me to stop scrolling and to take pause when you tweeted i keep thinking how we're more interconnected than ever before that's undeniable yet we have never misunderstood each other more which is certainly at least the way it feels right why do you think that's the case i think there's a couple reasons number one is that because of the abundance of digital and technology um we actually don't have to see each other in person anymore you know we tap touch us on our food deliveries we don't have to interact with the person that made the food or deliver the food we have boxes thrown at our door all day long especially during christmas we don't have to interact with a soul to get it We, we we tap likes and hearts on people that we've never even met but God forbid someone like calls us on the telephone. Like we don't even have to leave our house, to be honest with you. Um, and that's isolated ourselves. So that's number one. I think the second thing is that because of the abundance of information, the abundance of news out there, that um, actually we become 
more in our own rabbit holes. We're all in our own little bubbles. I mean, even, you know, uh, you know, us who are supposed to be in front of all these different uh, stories and, and, and industries, we still fall in our own bubbles. And because of that, because of the fact that everyone's in their own rabbit hole, um, we're not able to see everyone else's perspectives. We're mm. not able to understand everyone else. And so th I think that's the challenge that we have today. I don't know if you feel that. Well, man, I mean, everything you're saying is landing with me for sure. I'm, I'm also keeping an eye on the live chat because I know that, that this is going to be uh, <laughs> you're lighting a fire under people, which is great, including Tony, who's, who's currently looking for her bottle of Bailey's. But but I, I digress. Um, this is, uh, you know, for Kimberly, for example, says this has been a really hard year uh, to find the blessing, says Kimberly, mm. says found out this week that another friend lost his battle with mental health. I'm, Kimberly, we're so sorry to hear that. I mean, I mean, I, 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 I gosh, I don't know if I want to share this. I think I will. It's real talk. I mean, I woke up this morning. I know you're not supposed to check your phone right away, but I do. Um, and and uh, a friend of mine um, divulged that uh, that she had a. Uh, I want to let people know that she had a, a failed suicide attempt this week, wow. uh, and she decided to share it. And um, and uh, she's failed feels like a weird word to use, um, uh, but uh, we're so grateful that she's here with us. She she had this long post. She said this is gonna be my last post for a while, but she she she's writing to her family, but she's writing it publicly, uh, and and she's grateful she's still here. And uh, I mean I, we see these things all around us, and and again like I typed a response. You, you type a response. Uh, we love you. You have our full support. You're showing great courage, these types of things. But but still, like when you say we don't talk on the phone, when my phone rings, unless it's a family member, but when my phone rings, I go, John's heard it before. I go, come on. <laughs> like if somebody calls me, I go, come on. Like I don't want the phone calls. And and I find myself, and, and, and as you're laying it out and as you're spelling it out, I'm realizing that I do, and, and I'm a very social person. I mean, host events for a living, but like, being around people, I find that I do less and less. I withdraw. I pull myself back. And you see that trend big picture. You see that as a macro trend. Well, absolutely. I think people, we, we're isolating each other and isolating ourselves from everyone else more than ever before because of digital. And I'm a digital guy. Like, I'm a technology guy. Uh-huh. And, you know, at the end of the day, you know, because – Listen, I'm not a, a mental health expert, but I think we can correlate the the rise in digital with mental health issues. And I think for 2023, the best thing that we can do for ourselves, listen, the pandemic, I don't know what state we're in the pandemic. I never want to say it's over, but the best thing that we can do in 2023 is to share bread with each other, yeah. to actually converse, to have real talk, to re have real conversations with each other. That's the only way that we can understand each other. That's mm. the only way that we can sit there and share our opinions and perspectives. Um, and so we, we just need to do that more. Yeah, we were at a Christmas concert last night at our little guy's elementary school. And, and uh, you know, it's like all these parents gathering. And it was my first time. Our little guy's in grade two. It was their first Christmas concert in three years. There's kids there in grade three. It was their first Christmas concert. And, like, the principal's wearing a mask. And some parents are wearing a mask. And some aren't. And we don't need to get into that necessarily. We can if you want. But but to me, it was like the principal, it, it, behind his mask even, said he said, isn't this wonderful that for the first time in three years we're all together? And, I, and I'm thinking of all those movies movie scenes right of the proud parents with like the the big video cameras yeah. and the big long lenses and then celebrating their kids and just the, the the vibe and the feeling you look around and you recognize not everybody's at the same place there are some people that still aren't gathering in groups there are people that were gathering in groups the minute you were allowed to but everybody's coming together in one way shape or form live stream or otherwise to collectively be together totally and, and it fills your spirit and today and, and th this is the greatest time ever because last year uh, to me like christmas was canceled in my house the la obviously the year before that yeah christmas was canceled so this is the first time that families are coming together and friends are coming together and uh when you come together please sh you know share perspectives share opinions and I, I think it's just a beautiful time but everybody's nervous about not everybody that's not true uh some people are nervous about that too though because like you know i mean we have realized some things about some of our loved ones over the past few years that we didn't realize before. You know, we've realized like that one uncle is like a big Trump guy or we've realized that one cousin, you know, doesn't believe in the vaccine or on the flip side. You know, other people are going to be judging their family members for, for, for choices that they made out of self-preservation during the pandemic. It seems politically 
socially, uh, even you know, scientifically. Uh, some of us are, are, are feeling, I think, that our uh, wedges have been driven between meaningful friendships and family relationships. And for a lot of people right I, now, I, if, if families are getting together for the first time in three years, I bet some people are doing so with great trepidation. And, and I, think, I think that's okay, actually. I, I, I think um, having people with different perspectives comes together. That's what makes us human, to, to have conversation with each other and I think the problem with social media what it's done it's amplified and put us even more into these little rabbit holes 100% so so if you are anti-Trump you are super anti-Trump and I think back in the day when you were just a Trump fan let's let's take social media out of it you would just have a normal conversation with that person and understand their views so my my belief is that when we get together, yes, people are going to have different views. Yes, you're going to have somebody that's anti-vax. Yeah, you're going to have somebody that's a Trump fan. But that's okay. I, I think what we need to do is understand each other's position a little bit more. And actually, we've become so entrenched in our own opinions that it's it's hard to change people's mind. My advice is to – if you if you are so strong about a particular opinion, try to – Understand the other person's opinion. In, in, in fact, try to debate yourself mm. with facts. And if you can't debate yourself with those particular p- opinions, that means you have a religious belief around that particular opinion. Mm. That means, um, and so, m- my advice is that you know, embrace the other side, embrace the Trumpers. To just, un- this is why we got into uh, the problem in 2016. That's why he- Trump won. Is because. We didn't understand what other people were feeling, and we need to do a lot more of yeah, that. Now. I mean, I don't want to make this all about Donald Trump. It's the first example that came to mind. I mean, I see, you know, in, in, in totally. seriously, our podcast comes out every Wednesday. Sapri and I, we both identified it, our, identified our top news story of the year, uh, and, and, and Sapria beat me to it, and I think she nailed it. Her top story of the year, people can check it out, seriouslypod.com, The Freedom Convoy. Uh, there's an example closer to home. And, uh, you know, and, and I feel like this show, and John, you and I have had this conversation before off air, is, is, is sometimes I think this show has failed uh, in not being gutsy enough with the people that we talk to. You know, you can, you can as, a, as a talk show host, you want some real talk? Here's some real talk. As a talk show host, you can find yourself bending and flexing totally. and being influenced by people who will use phrases like platforming. Why would you talk to this person? Why would you platform this person? I mean, there's members of this audience that do not want me to interview the sitting premier of Alberta because they disagree with her views on something. And that blows my mind. And I'm always going to push back on that. I'm not saying if Adolf Hitler was alive, that we would bring Adolf Hitler on and ask him, hey, Adolf, you know, all things aside, why do you? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that people are in a position now where if they disagree with somebody on policy or politics, they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the justification for it. They don't want to pick that person's brain. They don't want to understand what led them to to endorse or believe or develop that policy. And that's where I think we get into real trouble. And that's why I've had some long nights staring at the ceiling, wondering if we're not going to do interviews like that. I, if we're not going to challenge the host, if we're not going to challenge the audience, maybe we should change the name of the show. No, I, I think I think you, you know, the reason why people love this show and the reason why people love you is because you are not afraid to dive into those conversations. This whole thing is about real talk. And if you're not able to uh, play with some of those provocative or controversial issues, then what, what is this show all about? What are about? we doing here? What are we doing here? And so um, if you dislike somebody, uh, that is not a reason not to understand them at the end of the day. Like, uh, I'll give you an example of this, Ryan. Like, I see people, for example, on Twitter being like, oh, anybody that follows Joe Rogan or listens to Joe Rogan um, – like forget them. I'm I'm gonna cut them from the from my life, um. And I always find that shocking because you can you can listen to Joe Rogan and still have four vaccines in your body and not and 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 be comfortable and just treat that as entertainment at the end of the day, right? And so you have to be able to separate um individuals and your religious beliefs with your own beliefs at the end of the day. Um, and so I just appreciate your show and the fact that you are having these real, real conversations and, and uh, God bless you guys. We, well, that means a lot, Sean. I appreciate the kind <laughs> words. We quote Stephen Covey probably more than anybody else on the show in his basic premise of seek to understand. Yeah. And I think that that's so important. And once you've stopped seeking to understand people whose opinions differ from yours, then you're in real trouble. And you know, on that point, I think 
the thing that we need to teach our kids, you, you got to, I got to, is I think we have forgotten how to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. We have not taught people how to have conversation, the art of conversation, the ability to listen to someone else's side, the ability to uh, make someone else feel like they're heard instead of waiting for our turn. Mm -hmm. And so um, I don't know if in school or, uh, it, you know, when people start, within business to, to actually get some skills around having that art of conversation. I think we've lost that. And I'm hoping that we can bring it back. Mm -hmm. Haas says, uh, I can learn something from everyone. So I take what I can use and I leave the rest. What do you think, Johnny? I think the best part of a conversation, wasn't it always like when you, when you started getting older, it was like being enlightened, mm. like having someone tell you an opinion and finally fully understanding it and maybe not agreeing with it, but being like, Wow, I get it now. And I feel like today it's all about the shutdown. I just want to shut this person down. Own that person. I want to prove them wrong. I yeah. want to make them feel like shit. There's no like thirst for knowledge, like he's saying, to get in their shoes anymore. It's just screw them, fuck them. I hate everything they stand for. Yeah, and here, that's it. Here's a cool point from Tracy on our live chat. Boy, do I appreciate our live chatters, man. They just they they just keep this show going with opinions and perspectives and and sometimes we'll check in on the live chat. They're debating something that totally. has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Tracy though says says I I actually disagree with with Sean. She says if if content makes and I want to give you a chance to respond to this. She says, if content makes you angry or sad or depressed, tune out and change to a medium or a platform that makes you feel better. Uh, that doesn't sound like bad advice either. I mean, nobody's I, saying you have to subject yourself to stuff that puts you in a bad mental state. Absolutely. And that's why we shout out people that are, um, you know, we, 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 we defriend, unfriend people um, that, that are um, feeling, making us feel bad, making us, you know, maybe they're toxic and, Maybe they're negative, and that's why we shut those people out of our lives. And same thing with content. And the problem with social media is that, to me, it's like it, it, is, it amplifies high-speed car crashes, meaning it amplifies inflammatory, low-quality information. And so naturally, when you're scrolling through Twitter, yeah. um, it's, it's going to make you feel bad. It is. And um, – People I, just want to see houses burn to the ground. Hundred percent. People want to see things burn to the ground, and when the fire is out and it's smoldering, they'll move on to the next person who's going to have their house burnt to the ground. It's like a it's like a swarm of locusts, totally. and that's not a compliment. Let's talk about your book. Yes, the, the bold ones. Uh, the you say that individuals ones. have become mini religions. Uh, I mean, are, are you talking about like? I mean, you mentioned Elon Musk, Jordan Peterson. <laughs> How about an example? Yeah. Uh, a homegrown out of Alberta, or, or I don't know. I'm trying to think of something like the Kardashians. I mean, are these religions more than more than celebrities or, 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 or soothsayers? I think at the end of the day, as individuals, we all worship. We all have affinity to things, to individuals. The idea of religion is having practices. It's having rituals around something that's beyond us, and. You know, I look at my son. He's three years old. He loves Paw Patrol, Marshall and Sky and Rubble. Like he worships worships them, right? Yeah, sure. He'll sit down. He'll watch them. Um, even this show. You know, this this show is on at eight thirty. This is a ritual for many people. They wake up listening to you. Now, now calling yourself a religious leader, I I know that sounds crazy. We would steer clear. But of in that. a sense, yeah. but it, <laughs> but in a sense, real talk is a. It's a, it's a community of people coming together that believe in a, 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 a th there's a sense of belonging here. And so we have to understand that individual, individuals are becoming the new mini religions mm. in a sense. Like we have affinity, we, we worship individuals. And this doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, obviously there are downsides to this that we believe in somebody so much and and sometimes you see the dark side of the cult and 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 people go off the deep end but for the most part we believe in individuals people trust people people care for people and i believe that there's a great power shift that's happening from institutions from firms from companies to individuals and so um yeah so while individuals have become the mini religions the phone has become the new church Mm. Right. And, and, and so that has become the portal to all these different religions. We have affinity and they, we worship, you know, people it doesn't have to be a bad thing. 
We're talking to Sean Canungo. He's got a new book out, The Bold Ones. Uh, you can find it anywhere you find great books. Uh, back with this disruption strategist in 90 seconds. Uh, between now and then, I want to remind you, if, if, if you're in trouble right now, quite frankly, you you, you don't, you haven't, it, forget about thawing out your, your turkey uh, for, for the big family dinner. You haven't even found a turkey yet. You've not bought a turkey yet. Now, we did our best to remind you that at Friesen.com, you could pick up that Ukrainian-inspired Christmas dinner prepared by the Red Seal chefs at Friesen Brothers, right? Now, we do have an announcement. This is great for them. It's great for the Real Talk community. It's not so good for those that don't have dinner yet, and that is that the Christmas dinner box is sold out at the award-winning Edmonton Friesen Brothers. The good news, they're still, I know the studio audience, they, they're not happy with this announcement, but what can we do? The advertising's just too effective here on Real Talk. They're sold out, but you can still order them in at Stony Plain and Fort Saskatchewan. And Johnny, that Fort Saskatchewan Friesen Brothers location, all we gotta let everybody know, they got beer on tap out there. You pick up a pizza, you have a cold one. Thank God. There you go, buddy. <laughs> you can order it at Friesen.com. And don't forget, custom Christmas gift boxes as well from our friends at Friesen Brothers. At Park Power, they know they're not pretending like it's cheap to pay for your utilities, to keep the house warm, to keep the lights on, let alone all the extra stuff. You're running space heaters. No extension cords, by the way. Remember that. But... What they do promise is that if you take two minutes to compare rates right now at parkpower.ca, there's a very good chance that you're going to pay less for electricity, natural gas, and internet with your friendly local utilities provider at Park Power. You go, you compare your rates, and then when you click on sign up, it's going to take you five minutes like it took me five minutes. And of course, I used our promo code. I wanted to put 70 bucks back in my jeans. 2022 Dash Real Talk is going to run you through till the 31st, which means you have nine days to use it. Why not make it today at parkpower.ca? So you've taken the one energy step. You've signed up with Park Power. Why not go all in with Kubi Renewable Energy? We told you earlier this week, one in five solar power systems installed in Western Canada are installed by the award-winning team at Kubi Renewable Energy. Tesla certified, guaranteed, and here's the best part. If you're like me and you can't stand paperwork, they do it all for you. That Canada Greener Homes Grant, $40,000, interest-free for 10 years. Kubi will get you signed up. They'll plot out your system, and the minute that their guys can be up on your roof safely, they'll get your solar panel system installed. A Merry Christmas from everybody at Kubi Energy. And a quick shout-out to our friends at Apex Automation. Are you recovered from the Christmas party? I'm finally a it's, full tank. It, it it's now been six days. We've had six sleeps since we partied with the team at Apex Automation. The point of bringing that up is that when they talk about people power, when they talk about people over profits, they mean it. I told you the story. They crowdfunded a condo down payment for one of their colleagues. She lost her husband this year. She had a horrible year. And quite frankly, she was struggling with the financial side of things. The team at Apex put their money where their mouth is. And that's the way they roll there. I mean, either what can I tell you besides that? This is a company that understands without their people, they're nothing. Oh, and they just so happen to be the best in Canada at automation, in the energy industry, in the brewing industry, in the software industry. Check out the careers link. If you're a professional engineer looking for a change of pace today at apexautomation.ca. We're hanging out with uh, the dynamic force that is Sean Canungo, an innovation strategist. I've seen you described as a disruption strategist as well. That's a word that are we, are we going round two here? Yeah, let's go round two a little bit, a little bit more Bailey's, a little more cream uh, in, in the in, coffee in the cup. All right, um, this is only going to get more entertaining and, as the time goes and, and, on. And by the way, before we get into the topic of disruption, because I know you're not going to do it because you're very humble. What's that? Um, listen, if you if you follow if you've been following Ryan. This this long, just like rate, review, subscribe to him wherever you are. YouTube, well, thanks, just buddy. give this guy some love. Sign up to the Patreon, and especially before tomorrow because there's a special party on tomorrow. It's just gonna be like, a great party. Just you know, you've been put. You're so good at this, by the way. I'm I'm sitting here. I'm watching you do your thing. 
You are well, damn you know, good we, at this thing. Doing, we've crap. been doing it for a while, and uh, he loves and, and, praise. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> uh huh. I appreciate it, and you're, and, and and you're going because you're so humble. And there's some people watching and listening, going, well, I don't know about that, uh, but I will say that you know you got to find that fine line. It's like when you talk to professional so, athletes, and they say, I don't like how how he celebrates when he scores a goal, and I always say, no, you know, what's the fine line between confidence and arrogance? Because to succeed at a high level, sometimes you have to believe in yourself. So so let's talk about that. For for a second because you know the reason why I wrote this book the bold ones is because I really believe that there was this power shift happening from organizations from institutions to individuals I believe that you are actually part of this you know you you found um that by believing in yourself by actually betting on yourself and starting this based on sponsors based on your listeners that you could actually create not only a successful business, but support other people and their families and create an audience and community. Um, and you did that by yourself mm. because of the power of the media. And I believe that actually you're an example and I feel like because of your talent and because you're, you're a master at your craft, you're able to do that. But I believe that everybody, you don't have to necessarily go out and be a creator or a founder or an entrepreneur, but within your organization that you can go off and – you know, find what you are good at, double down on that, and be truly indispensable. And I, I feel that you're an example. I didn't, I didn't, you know what? I'm, I, I, I regret this because I wrote this book, The Bold Ones. I didn't include you, but you are, you are an example of a bold one. Well, I appreciate that. And, and Johnny, I don't know about you, but I, f I feel like also, I mean, like, like you've acknowledged, and I try to say it every single day, uh, without the audience and without our sponsors, this show is nothing. I mean, you're broadcasting into the vapor and it doesn't, it doesn't really matter at all. But, but I think a big part of the audience that's here and the people that show up, I mean, thousands. Thousands and thousands of people every day are downloading this podcast or checking it out on YouTube, which we appreciate as well. I think that there was a big group of people as well. You want to talk disruption. Mainstream media these days is a mess. I mean, I was just talking to Robin Doolittle about, about paywalls and things like that. And, and, and news, I mean, the Globe and Mail may be one thing, but at the same time, you look at regional or local newspapers, they died on the vine. You look at radio stations and oh, how man. they treat staff. It's over. You look at how popular morning show hosts are just mm -hmm. shuttled out, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you always feel, I don't know about you Johnny but we've both been on air obviously for a lot of years and 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 I would do every show like it was my last because you never knew with that anvil over your head when it was going to fall so 100%. I mean the, the word disruption means something to guys like well, us. there's a ladder to media now it's like you're trying to go up 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 with like let's take radio you're on nights you're on middays you're on drive you get to mornings now you're at the top of the ladder and yeah. you're just teetering there and you want to there's a guy in an office in Toronto who's just looking at numbers one day and says, why are we paying this person X when we yeah. can pay them Z? It doesn't matter. You know that the, I mean? and, it and, doesn't, and we're not complaining. This is not us bitching and complaining. This is just a fact. It's just a but fact. It, like, it doesn't matter if, if the show is the top show in the city, and no. it doesn't matter if you were just volunteering at the food bank, and it doesn't matter if everybody knows your name, and it, none of that matters. It's a, it's a dollars and cents thing. So, so when you talk, like when you use a word like disruption, I guarantee, I mean, maybe why don't we put this out to our lobby, live audience right now? I mean, what is, so, so real talkers that are watching us live, that are listening, on the Mixler live audio stream even that's presented by California Closets. Why don't you let us know? What does disruption mean to you? How does it manifest itself in your world? We know what disruption means to us. Yeah. You know? And and, and to be to, to be honest, like disruption can be an opportunity. Disruption can be a positive thing. I see disruption as something, someone, some technology coming out of nowhere and changing the status quo. But I actually think that we can see that as a positive. I, I believe that anybody can be a disruptor and change their own status quo. And so I love this word disruption, but I'd love to see what the what the chat says about disruption. Yeah, well, we'll let it go, and we'll give some people some okay. time to to, sh to share. And but the, but this is like, I mean, I guess when 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 people look at you know, for example, you spent twelve years at Deloitte. People might have heard of that company. Uh, working with with corporate leaders to better plan, and I love how your bio reads: opportunities associated with disruptive innovation. For a lot of people, disruption is a dirty word, right? Yeah. If, you're, if, you're, if you're hosting something, doing something, working on something, selling something, the last thing you want is a disruption. Yeah. Well, you know, I think um, you can see disruption as a negative, things like the pandemic, but you can, you can also see disruption as a positive. Look, look at how the pandemic has fundamentally changed how we look at work, how we... Um, how we do things. I believe that, for example, the pandemic was the bubble that bursted in terms of people actually embracing digital, embracing technology, embracing new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. um, so I really see as um, disruption being a, a, an opportunity for everyone to see, how do I reinvent what I'm doing? How do I reimagine what I'm doing? And, you know, I, 
it's funny because I've been working my entire career helping corporate executives with idea of understanding how they can use disruption to reinvent their business. But the reason why I wrote this book was to understand how can individuals reinvent themselves? Like how can you disrupt yourselves? How do you get yourself fired before somebody else fires like you? Like how do you see it coming? Exactly. Yeah, how, how do, do you, you see it coming? Yeah, I mean, this is interesting. You know, people are saying, you know, Justin, for example, says, I'm personally all for disruption. Uh, and then he says, most of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, Justin. Says, I'm usually on the side of get on board or be left behind. He says, typically, as it pertains to, to technological advances. Um, Kim says, disruption is forced change. Yep. Uh, Plain Power says, disruptions always require course correction. Some good, some bad. Uh, what about this from Lauren, who says, you know, disruption is a family member in crisis. It's mm. not all business. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and it could be. Um, and that's why the idea of disruption can apply to so many different things. And I, I think let's just at the just for 2023, let's let's flip disruption as opportunity. If something is um, going poorly in your life or something has come out of nowhere, how can you flip that and look at the bright side and the opportunity? And, you know, that's what I would really want to frame in the book. Adventure Cycling. I happen to know personally his name is Brad. He's been a wonderful friend of the show. He's a brain injury survivor. He's a competitive cyclist. The guy's a machine. Uh, he's one of these guys, like, when he when he watches Real Talk or when he listens to Real Talk, he's on one of these, like, he's on a, a cycling thing, like a mounted okay. bike. He does, he'll, he'll be like, I banged out 130K while I was listening to it. And he just wow. makes, me, he I'm makes eat, me feel lazy. I'm eating Brad, chips while yeah. I'm, while I'm <laughs> watching. We're sitting here with our comfortable leather. But anyway, so here's what Brad says. Uh, he says, disruption is what makes us grow. Uh, he says, if I didn't go through my accident years ago, it was a bike crash. He says, I would not be where I am today. Uh, Tracy says, disruption is good and bad. Always going to be challenges and innovative solutions. Uh, I like that she brings this up. The labor market is going to bring many challenges. But I think that, that hybrid or remote work is healthy. I mean, heck, we just talked about Apex Automation, one of our sponsors. Yeah. And I and I, I was joking, and I don't think Adam uh, Berlinick, the founder of the company, would mind me saying this. I was hanging out with him. I, I visited their corporate headquarters. You see their team at work developing this software, and, and he goes, we're automating this at a SAG-D facility, and we're automating this at a potash mine, and we're automating... And, and, and I go, yeah, but like, you know, all these people are like, think of all the jobs they're going to lose, right? That's 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 hitting a, an issue head on. And, uh, and he goes, no... He says, people, he says, you look at what happens in these companies and people are being reassigned to more fulfilling and totally. less dangerous work. He and says, you still need people to operate these systems. People can be retrained. People can be qualified for new things. In a lot of circumstances, people are getting raises. I mean, but that is a major disruption. A job you've been doing for 30 years becomes automated all of a sudden. Absolutely. But throughout history, that happens. I mean, you used to have telephone operators that were moving cables every time people wanted to have a phone call. Absolutely. And I think, you know, technology is on an exponential scale. Things like artificial intelligence intelligence you know there's this you know chat gpt that's come out everybody's talking about that's um you know really being a human-like sort of ai can we talk about this yeah let's, is, let's, is, is this the one that's like writing books and like writing it's, it's all ai yeah and i'm choked to be honest because i just wrote a book and i could have just wrote it using yeah but I've, I've seen some pretty so, epic fails <laughs> <laughs> well yeah that's true um yeah so chat gpt is a uh is a platform created by open ai um, and it's an AI platform that anybody can access right now. You put in a particular prompt, like tweet like Ryan Jesperson, and it will um, it it will it will do that, or, 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 or it will um, you know help you uh, you know organize your next party. It will help you uh, you know design your next house. Um, there's so many applications to it, and people are saying, "Wow!" I mean, this is just the first inning of it. And, and I don't think we understand the exponential nature of something like ChatGPT or this artificial intelligence and how it's going to help us do, do so many things. And I think this is actually a positive. This is actually a disruptive. Yes, it a strikes me as it's not something that's inherently good or bad. It's not black or white, is it? Well, to be honest with you, every single technology to me is, you know, at least it's either 51% good and 49% bad. You know, every set technology has a downside to it. Um absolutely. I mean, you look at social media, at some point it was 51% good and 49% bad. You look at it now, people are probably saying it's 51% bad, 49% um good, but um like any technology, it's going to have its disadvantages, but I think what it's ultimately going to 
going to do, just like to your point of uh, talking to the CEO of a Apex, is that ultimately it's going to allow us to be more human. And, I, and my default is when it comes to any sort of disruption is how do we make work more human? And so I think what artificial intelligence is going to do is it's going to fundamentally democratize technology. It's going to put it in our pocket so that we can actually do more human things. We can double down on what matters, like our employees, our customers, our clients, and whoever else. And um, I think it's a beautiful thing that we're going to have this in our pocket. Um, and um, I'm excited to see where it's going to go. This is just the first inning. And it, this is the whole thing with um, disruption, Ryan, is that disruption always starts as a joke. It starts out as creepy or it, st it starts out as, as something that people just dismiss. But later on, you know, the joke is really on us. Mm. It really uh, changes our behaviors. It changes our expectations and happens with every single disruptor. We're talking to uh, innovation strategist Sean Canungo. You can check out his new book, The Bold Ones, and check out his website, seancanungo.com. And, and, and by the way, on that note, by the way, I thought it I thought it'd be really cool. If you email I'm not the, rapping, by the way. I know. I'm I'm just gonna I'm just okay. gonna throw this out right sure. now. Um if you email uh the show, I will get you a uh I, I will randomly select uh, someone from uh, the emails. Just tell Ryan this, how much you love the show, what you love about the show. Email him, and I will get you a signed copy oh. of the book. Put in your uh, mailing address. Okay, in there great. And let, let Talk at RyanJesperson.com. Why, why, why don't we say we'll choose it? We, want, we always want to give the podcast a chance to land, so why don't we keep it open for like 24 hours? Let's do that. Okay, do so that. people yep. have a chance to yep. listen to the podcast, which is, is usually, Johnny, it's usually at what, like 11 a.m. or something like that, Mountain, 1, 1 p.m. East, something like that-ish. Unless Johnny and I are into it's the Baileys, you want it. it's on demand. The no, but I mean, like when it first blasts out, it's usually it's usually right around eleven. Usually around time. ten thirty, ten thirty, mountain 11 time, something like that. So we'll give him twenty four hours. Perfect. Talk at RyanJesperson dot com. We'll get you to sign a copy of the bold ones. Uh, Sean Canugo. I wanted to drop back in on this. Uh, Justin says this could be fun. Uh, get the AI to write an ad read for Freezen Brothers in the style. <laughs> Let's of, do it. Yeah. It would just be all about the sourdough cinnamon buns. That's chat, what it would be. The chat's on fire right now. Yeah, it do. is. It is. I mean, Brenda says disruption can be accepting change. You know, an yep. example, going along in life and something happens, like a loved one being hospitalized and you got to be there um, out of routine. But we change for the good, Brenda. Amazing. Um, uh, what about this? Hey, Jill, making a great point, uh, says students have started using this specific AI for assignments. And he says it will disrupt academia. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, when ki kids are already writing essays using chat GPT, uh, Kids are already um, doing their homework using ChatGPT. And I think this is great. I actually think that it's great because it's going to allow us to do uh, what school uh, should be doing is helping us understand how to solve problems. Not It's not around memorization or um, – you know, finding solutions, but it's actually how do we ask better questions? Yeah. How do we solve problems? How do we work with each other in better ways? And that's what school school should be. Beyond that, you know, making friends and um, making love like that. That should be what school is really about. I'm talking about university. Yeah, okay. okay. Like, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Listen, yeah. I, I have a question. Yeah. <laughs> Go. So you're talking about breaking bread and, you know, we need to get closer. But what do you think of like the metaverse? Is that do you think that's a negative thing then is going to draw us, you know, more? I feel 85 years old. But what do you mean? The Like, you know, like when we're in, uh, fully locked into a digital sort of virtual world. reality where we don't leave our house, we may even work in the metaverse. We yeah. may live there, yeah. chat with people there. So so my, my my opinion on the metaverse is I believe the metaverse is not a place, but really it's a journey. Um, we always think that the metaverse is this like locked in virtual reality headset. We're like mm -hmm. in this sort of virtual ecosystem. But I believe that the metaverse might be a journey. It might we might be in the metaverse right now We're we're we're. On our phones, you're you're listening to this, you're watching this on a digital platform. Like we might be in a early version of the metaverse right now. And I believe that perhaps the metaverse in a sick way makes us actually more humans. Uh, I don't actually believe that we're gonna be locked into this virtual reality headset in this solo uh, sort of uh, sort of mode. I believe that maybe the metaverse allows us to just whether it's augmented reality, it allows us to actually interact with humans uh, a little bit more. It's allowing us to drop our phones. Imagine us dropping our phones and being able to interact with each other. And the metaverse is just uh, just an augmentation using you know glasses or w whatever else to just get us data or to do things a little bit more seamlessly. Maybe there's an opportunity for us to make life more human because I believe that in you know 50 years we're gonna look back at all these pictures from the the 2000 era and be like. 
oh my god, everybody's all the pictures are just people on their phones the entire time. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. And, and I'm one of the people. And so am I. Like, like so I, am I. I dropped my phone outside We're our office earlier people, yeah. this year, and I smashed my phone. It was unusable. Um, and for two days until I got it all figured out, I didn't have a phone, and I felt like empty. And so full at the same totally. time, like losing a limb. Yeah, but like totally. part of me was like, part of me was like, nobody can get in touch with me. And then part of me was like, nobody can get in touch with me. And it was, <laughs> you know what I mean? It was kind of this weird thing. Totally. Yeah, I've heard people say I was reading from. I'm always trying to read, you know, like you. It's why I follow you on Twitter and others. Is I'm always looking for people that'll have these these inspirational tips or ideas. Sometimes it's these tweaks you can make in your life, not these transformative changes, but tweaks you can make in your life. And I was reading from a guy the other day. I don't know if you buy this or not. He said that he only ever charges his phone up to 30%, mm. which would just give me panic all day. Um, but he said, and he keeps it on airplane mode. And so when he's ready to check his phone, when it's like that scheduled time of day, I told my wife about this. She said, don't get any ideas. We have a six month old at home. But when he's ready, he takes it off airplane mode and he gets hit with all the texts and the emails and the notifications. And he, and he ticks off his list to the allotted time. And then he puts it back on airplane mode. And he says, and I never use the 30% battery. I never run out. I thought, wow. gosh, what a way to, 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 you know, in a sense, take control back of the, the, the dominating force that technology can be in your own personal life. It works for him anyway. What a psychopath. No, no, that's... that. That's <laughs> 30%? <laughs> I'm like, I would have such anxiety at 30% battery to start the day? Are you kidding Listen, me? Listen, my happiness is dictated uh, by the battery life in my phone. So if I'm at 76%, that's my happy... No, no, that's actually a great idea. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that's phenomenal. And what I've been trying to do is like when I'm with the kids or... Um, when I'm with my family, just to literally physically leave the phone away, so that you're not itching, you're not you're not grabbing your phone, you're not tapping it. Um, I think that's so uh, that's so important. I love that tip. Yeah. Um, let me ask you this in closing. Uh, you you talk about, uh, and I know that obviously you keep a keen eye on what's happening in business and big business, and and one of the stories of the year. You know what I'm going to talk. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Do, if I if I say 44 billion, you know exactly what I'm going to talk <laughs> about. One of the biggest stories of the year, obviously, is that one of the world's most prominent entrepreneurs, one of the richest people in the world, Elon Musk, has has obviously secured ownership of and control over the world's biggest messaging platform, which is. Twitter. Uh, he put it to a poll and asked people if he should leave, if he should appoint a new CEO of Twitter, and, and it, it in a way blew up in his face, and people suggested that he should leave, so he may be looking for a new CEO. If that was you... What would you do with Twitter? Well, n number one, let me tell you that t Twitter is the most fascinating thing for me because I think Twitter is not real life. Um, I think that I saw some polls recently that 14% of Canadians are actually on Twitter. 14%. Um, I've seen other studies that 17% of Canadians are on Twitter. And 97% of tweets come from 25% of the users. Sure. So, so that means like a very small percentage of people are actually on Twitter. But the problem is, is that you see 99% of the 100% of the media on Twitter. So whatever happens on Twitter actually becomes the news in some sort of way. It actually creates narratives. It creates stories um, better than anything else. And that's why Elon, um, I think in, in some respect, has bought Twitter because it is the greatest storytelling platform on the planet. Um, and I, I'm actually interested because... For some reason, Elon um, is the he's always the news story because of Twitter, and it shouldn't be. Twitter is not real; it's not real life, and it's in the amount of people that are on it. It should be inconsequential, but because it drives narratives in a world because of the media, it's become important. And to me, it's it's disheartening because you have somebody like Elon who is literally creating rockets. He is creating... He's commercializing uh, space. He's, he's, he, he's made uh, eight changing, TVs mainstream. Yeah, he's changing the narrative when it comes to electric vehicles. And because he is a divisive character on Twitter, people dislike him or what he's doing. And and I think it's a it's a hit on his legacy. Um, not just people dislike him, but if I'm a Tesla shareholder, which I'm not, or if I own or drive a Tesla, which I don't, but I have friends who drive Teslas and they're remarkable vehicles, I, I would be demanding that he knock it off. I mean, you saw this. I can't remember the fellow's name. Uh, uh, a Korean billionaire. He's one of, the, one of the 500 richest people in the world, and he's the, the third largest shareholder in Tesla, and essentially described himself as an Elon Musk disciple mm. uh, no longer than two years ago, um, publicly demanded that Elon Musk step down from Tesla's leadership because of what's happening to the share price. Yeah. He, I mean, it's not just that people I, that he rubs people the wrong way. There are billions of dollars at stake.
Yeah, and I saw Elizabeth Warren uh, tweet out that we should be investigating Tesla because he's he's unloading so many shares or uh, investigate Elon. You know, at the end of the day, when it comes to um, Twitter, I think it is such a difficult job to to have. Number one, to moderate free speech, to figure out what what should we be. Uh, policing what should be on the platform and what shouldn't be that's an impossible task i think it's a lose-lose situation you're always going to have people that will disagree with that so that's number one but um when it comes to becoming the ceo of twitter going back to your original question um i would unfortunately what i would do is probably run it to the ground because i would reduce the amplification on twitter i would remove the likes and the retweets and the likes because i think probably Part of the problem oh, of people Twitter would lose their minds yeah. if you did that. Well, well, the part of the problem with Twitter is that social media amplifies extremists. What it means is that it amplifies extreme views. The more opinionated that you are, the more validation that you get. So people are incentivized to say the craziest shit ever, and True. that actually gets what the views. You know, it's like, are you not entertained? I don't know where that's from, but like the Gladiator, are you not entertained? And so if you remove that, and People just follow people because just they like them, not because they're the most um, uh, retweeted people. Then you're you're going to remove the amplification piece because what happens with amplification and what happens with opinions? Unfortunately, what's happened with social media is social media has made opinions a new form of status, mm. and people are now incentivized to say the craziest shit, and that's what gets the most retweets. You can't be in the middle. You can't say something that's boring or mediocre. That's if you actually ask people on the street, uh, hey, what do you think of? Elon, they'll be like, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Or like, what do you think of, El like, make this local, make yeah. it localized. Yeah. Uh, what, what do you, you think of Pierre Poliev or Justin Trudeau or, or yeah. Chuck Meet you know, or Danielle Smith and you know what's, or Rachel Notley? And you know what people say with Danielle Smith? They're like, um, yeah, maybe we'll give maybe, maybe we'll give her a chance. I'm, I'm, I'm not too sure. I want to see your policies. That's not going to get some retweets on Twitter. <laughs> you got to say that she's the devil or she's the best <laughs> thing that has ever happened. That's what will get the retweets and the likes. You can't say Daniel Smith is – you can't give her a chance. I lied to you. Uh, I said that was going to be – they teach you this in, in interviewing 101. Never say – never say final question. <laughs> never say it because you're always going to lie to the interview – E and you're gonna lie to the audience, um, but but we will close on this because we got to get to trash talk. Yes, and uh, and and I see some some folks are concerned on the live chat that you and I are too deep into the Baileys. <laughs> I'll let them know we're just getting Ooh. started. It's December twenty second. We're in major overtime, but I knew it would happen. We're in major overtime. Year, what, yeah. what do you want me to like? Put listen, a, this you, is. Do you want me to put a lid on this guy? We've got are you trash kidding talk. Me? Listen, got a this is the movie review. This is the We've last got, show of the year. The last show we of got the year. The, we got the Baileys flowing. <laughs> We're talking about Elon. <laughs> We're giving like, away books. We're giving away books. We're getting crazy right now. But you argue in your book that status is an ugly word. Yeah. And why is status an ugly word? I well, mean, everybody, people, not everybody, people spend their entire lives trying to achieve clout or status. Yeah. You know, you know, I actually think that status is ugly and unbelievable at the same time. Status is the reason why we have so many innovations. It's the reason why we want to create a better world. We always want something that somebody else has. To me, status is just simply the idea of feeling valued at the end of the day. But I think status is the, actually the thing that holds us back. It's the thing that actually prevents us from innovating um, because we, we hold on to our expertise, we hold on to what's working today, we hold on to our seniority, and um, in order to innovate, in order to ultimately disrupt yourself, you have to disrupt your own status, your own expertise, your own standing. And um, I think by removing status, by placing ourselves in what would many people would say lower status situations, like get the coffee, pour the Baileys, you know, do the meeting minutes. Once we put ourselves in these situations, we will start this idea of how do I remove status from my life? And that is actually how you start disrupting yourself. We've got a request here, and I, I hope you don't mind. Uh, Neve, we, we, yeah, we, yeah, Neve, we, we've people got, are wondering who pe she is. People want to know who's the who's the <laughs> photographer in the studio. Can you can you come on set? Do you mind? Sure. Can you can you share a mic with Sean and and uh, Sean? Who's this? Yeah, sh so this is Neve. Uh, she's my creative lead. She's the person that's actually creating all the videos and edits, and she's uh, she's actually unbelievable at that. So. Well, Neve, I've seen your work, and it's phenomenal. Welcome to the Real Talk Studio. What's something that you're grateful for this holiday? season oh um i am grateful that i'll just be able to spend the time with my family a lot of my family doesn't live here so 
um, getting to actually see them again will be great. Wonderful. Thank you for spending time with us in the studio. And today. by the way, she, she, she's unbelievable. And, and what she does is, is incredible. Um, uh, the other thing is she just came back from Mexico last night. Ooh, last and, night. Yeah. And uh, she just had like a week in in sunny Mexico. And then she got hit with like minus 45. Where did you go? Where where in Mexico did you go? Um, Playa del Carmen. How was it? It was really good. It was really warm. Yeah. Really what nice. was what was the temperature when you left? Uh, I think like 31. And what was it when you landed? Minus 33. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Well, a very happy holidays to you, Neve, and, and you do phenomenal work uh, for Sean, and obviously clearly a very important team member. Thank you for hanging out with us today and uh, bringing what we knew would be just like off the charts energy and <laughs> insight. And, and uh, we've we've uh, Johnny and I, uh, Johnny alluded to it. The live chat here has been uh, going off. And I know that when the podcast drops, we're going to see a lot of action on this as well. Talk at Ryan is where you can send us an email to qualify to win a signed copy of the bold ones by Sean Canungo. And you can check out his website, Sean best bestselling author, disruption strategist. Disruption is opportunity let me read this uh from uh dan schwabel the new york times best-selling author uh people know him in the business world as managing partner of workplace intelligence uh, the bold ones Kaningo's book unpacks the dna of disruptors showing us how to make a dent in any field as compulsively readable as it is actionable sean's innovation playbook is a shot of adrenaline to the <laughs> career how's that i love that that's a Listen, nice holiday review that 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 is really nice um well, thank you so much for having me on. It Thanks was for such, being here. Thanks such, for the Baileys. Thank, listen, thank you guys so much. And and I, I want to say this: I know this is the last show of the year, and I know you're gonna do your you're gonna talk to your Patreon guests, and you're gonna do a wrap up. But sincerely, on behalf of all Edmontonians um, and people around the world, like not just Edmontonians, pe- pe- people people listen to this show all around the world. Um, thank you for putting in. Uh, the love and the effort into this and you can see it the way that you show up the way that you prepare um, the way that you speak to your guests um, it is a master class and I, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart well that means a lot to me Sean uh, I really do considering the source I appreciate that uh, SeanCanungo.com uh, check out his book The Bold Ones anywhere you find good books thanks my man thank you thank I you. love it innovation disruption there you have it this conversation has been presented by our friends at Sherwood and St. Albert Dodge. They've got 2022 Dodge Durangos with up to $5,500 in total discounts right now. You can shop them online or in person out in St. Albert. They've got that beautiful new dealership, including that service department. They understand that the relationship doesn't end when the sale is made. In fact, that's when it starts. They're proud of their referrals and their return business. If you're looking to get your family into a 4x4 that'll give you the driving confidence you need on area highways this winter, check out St. Albert and Sherwood Dodge. Now, of course, you know we have a tradition coming up. On uh, uh, We're going to wrap this show, John. It's a special Thursday edition of Trash Talk. Yeah, presented of course, by our friends course, at, at Local Environmental Services. Yeah. And, and in a somewhat, it's not unprecedented, but but one of the submissions we received just yesterday okay. was so good that, that we've decided it's going to be a standalone Trash Talk because I love it. Just one. I'm going to try to read it in this guy's voice. But before we do... What? There's two things that I wanted to mention. Okay. First things first. This is the last time that we're going to have the audience's ear collectively before December 31st. Okay. Why is this especially significant? Because there's an early bird prize relating to the Real Talk Pond Hockey Classic. The, the deadline will hit when the clock strikes midnight Ooh. on December 31st. Uh, February 4th, that's a Saturday. We're going to gather at Larry Alexic Field in St. Albert. The city of St. Albert is rolling out the red carpet for us. They're creating a venue for the annual Real Talk Pond Hockey Classic in support of Kids Sports St. Albert and Uncles and Aunts at Large. You go to ryanjesperson.com, click on the events link, and click on Pond Hockey. We're looking for 36 teams of five skaters, volunteers, and sponsors. As we celebrate Canadiana in what is always a wonderful annual tradition. Think bonfires, think cold beers and hot burgers. Think tunes spun by DJ Johnny Infamous. Think not minus 30, hopefully. Probably. (laughs) It's going to be a beautiful day. 
And no matter what the weather is, we know that there will be smiles smeared across folks' faces. If you register your team before December 31st, you qualify to win a $500 early bird prize pack, all in support of charities associated with the Canadian Progress Club of St. Albert. Thanks in advance to those of you that have already signed up. We know it's going to sell out. It always does. 36 teams. Make sure you register yours today. Of course, every month we also give away an email of the month prize. We and do. You saw the mugs that, that Johnny and Sean and I are drinking out of this morning. These beautiful Real Talk Ceramic Studio mugs. By the way, manufactured and made in Canada. Nice. Everything that we sell on our merch page is proudly made in Canada. As we support local. And we had to wrestle a little bit with this month's email of the month because we've had some really, really good ones. But when we received this email... On December 1st, yeah, that's right, the first day of the month, this email uh, arrived. You can see if you're looking on camera what I wrote. I, I don't want to show their, I shouldn't show their email address. Look at that, EOTM I wrote on it. I said, I'm pretty sure this might be the email of the month. And this was from Mark. You remember Mark who wrote in after we were talking politics and, and after I was talking to Rick Bell and Graham Thompson, the obviously veteran uh, provincial political watchers and journalists, and, and both of them talked about politicians who have had to pivot to attract more mainstream support. And, and, and Mark wrote in to say, I, I, like, I, I'm really losing it. He says, like, it's okay to do this pivot. He says, why the hell do we let politicians pivot And why do we trust them when they do? Like, essentially, if they pivot, argued Mark, they lied to somebody. Was it me or the person on the other side of the pivot? He says, look at politicians. Uh, Why do we accept that they'll tell one group one thing and then tell another group something else? What have we sunk to that we don't expect integrity, honesty, and morality from the people who represent us? We should not normalize pivoting and we should not become used to it. That from Mark, who went on to further his argument. We read it on December 2nd's show, if you want to hear it in its entirety. Mark, congratulations. You don't have to do anything. Our general manager at Relay, our parent company, Katie, will be in touch with you for your mailing address and will proudly send you a Real Talk studio mug Mm. for being the author of the email of the month. We do it every month. You can send us your thoughts to talk at ryanjesperson.com. So is this it? Are we ending the show? Is this trash talk? Are we done? Yeah, I mean, except for the Patreon exclusive holiday party over Zoom tomorrow. Oh my gosh! But I'm getting that, emotional. Yeah, it's going to be exciting. <laughs> we don't want to tell I... people who the surprise guests are, but they're going to be good. You won't want to miss it. I want to say two things before we go. Okay. Number one, we didn't get to the holiday review, but I want to. Oh get no, it... no, let's do it. No, no, it's quick. I'm just going to show it here. It's no, called... let's do it. We're going to do it. No, it's called Love Hard. Can I hang on? Hang on. Very hang on. Hang on. No, hang on. Because this is my oversight. <laughs> this is my oversight. No, no, there's no John. Because I have to recognize a real talker who wondered why we weren't calling the feature i mean it's, it's been it's been it's been hicks holiday music reviews and nostra wrote in to ask why it's not hicks flick picks that's a pretty good name and i had no good answer so ladies and gentlemen without any further ado exclusively here on real talk it's hicks flick picks it's a quick one so this is this is produced uh and made in vancouver filmed in vancouver love hard uh real talker brett Alerted me to love hard. It starts Nina Dubrev. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, Jimmy O. Yang, who you know, amazing comedian, uh, and uh, Darren Barnett. So basically, I can explain it by looking at this photo, and I think you can too as well. A rom com. Uh, Jimmy O. Yang, Josh, uh, catfishes her into thinking that she's talking to uh, the most front-facing gentleman there, uh, Darren Barnett, who plays Tag. Uh, she comes to his small town of Lake Placid from L.A. She's a big writer and uh, ends up uh, falling for Tag, but doesn't know that she's actually talking to to Jimmy O'Yang, who plays uh, Josh in the background. So she's falling for his personality. But the guys looks and eventually the whole thing gets figured out. And what happens at the end, Ryan? Can you can you tell me? Uh, John, they all <laughs> they, they, they just when they thought love wouldn't happen. There it was. It happens in the most li- unlikely circumstance. But the big thing here uh, filmed in Vancouver and real talker Brett was actually one of the uh, cameramen on there. And the uh, lead photography director of photography rather uh, also did a uh, Terminator Salvation. So it's filmed the filming on this, even though it's a, a comedy, a cheesy Christmas movie. Some of the camera work is absolutely incredible if you watch it. So go check it out on Netflix. The other thing I want to mention just before we go, because I know you're going to forget, is that we had a guest on this week uh, who runs Harvest Sky Animal Rescue. 
And oh. from their appearance on this show, he received a $5,000 donation. That blew my mind. So we want to give a big shout out. Cactus Sheriff, he's in the chat right now. Is he there? Absolutely incredible. It's out in Hannah, I believe, Alberta. But So right after the show, anonymous donation. He has no idea who did it, but they watched the show and they sent him five grand. So. Yeah, I don't. I, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. You're right. I was going to forget it. It had nothing to do with Sean or the Baileys. It was just <laughs> that we, we got a lot going on. Um, but to hear yeah, and Trevor, his real name that joined us, uh, Cactus Sheriff in the chat that that uh, he came on to talk about animal rescues. He said times have been tough for everybody. I mean, just check out the interview. It starts. Uh, he was on our radar because we were joking about people, including my cousin, that my cousin has a domesticated bison uh, <laughs> that you can like literally. I mean, I don't get in the pen with it but he does uh, they don't put kids in the pen it's not you know it's not lunacy mm-hmm. um but he yeah he like rides on its shoulders and stands on its back and i mean it's just wild to see and cactus sheriff was like yeah what's the big deal we have pet bison and uh he's and got so he, several indoor like calves and there's a lot <laughs> he's of showing us family photos yeah. of a bison on a halter it's halter trained in the house um <laughs> but anyway just a delightful guy and he came on and, and he, he had said to us ahead of time do you mind if we mention harvest sky right Harvest Sky Animal Rescue, and uh, and he and he mentioned some of the challenges that and and you know what I loved about him about Trev I, I loved a lot of things about him, um, but he didn't he tried to he didn't make it about just his rescue. He said animal rescues like basically across the country and probably around the world right now are struggling because people are surrendering COVID pets <laughs> and uh, times are tough and the cost of food is going up and all the costs are going up and donations are going down and you don't have to be a CEO to understand what the business implications are and to know that a real talker. Uh, donated five thousand dollars anonymously, and and Incredible. by the way, I, I followed up with him to fact check it just to make sure, and he said that he is of the understanding that whoever that donor was donated fi- splashed some cash around to a number of animal rescues, which wow. was even more incredible. That's incredible. Uh, so the timing of that filled our hearts. And thank you for bringing that up. I'm so mm-hmm. grateful for you, Johnny. It's a good one to end the year on. It's a and wonderful like if, one to end the year on. Just another thing, like if you're out there like last minute puppy shopping, like go to an animal rescue. Yeah. There's tons of animals, cats, dogs, hamsters, consider, consider rabbits. Consider adopting they're a all, senior dog yeah, or a senior overloaded. cat. They're Absolutely. hundred percent. You're like the conscience of the show. I love it. Uh, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's. Now, typically this happens on a Friday. I, I just saw a painter Lee on the live chat say, Real Talk has Patreon? What? My friend. If you go to ryanjesperson.com and you click on connect, look at this. You click on connect and you go down to Patreon and it'll take you. We wouldn't be able to accomplish without you. And what that means... Sometimes it's, you know, when we're doing our question of the week, for example, we're hoping to bring that back in the new year. Uh, It means that you get access to the top line reports, the inside insights. Sometimes you get a behind the scenes video tour of the studio. Sometimes you'll get a special photo that we don't share publicly. Sometimes, like last month, we're going to send you something in the mail, a custom piece of Real Talk merch that's not available on the website. We try to find ways to thank you for supporting the show in a way that means the world to us. And so Painter Lee and everybody else, if you want to check out our Patreon, you can go do that right now. You go to the Connect link at ryanjesperson.com. <laughs> and tomorrow's going to be so much fun. Are you wearing pajamas? Have you decided what you're wearing on the show tomorrow? Uh, no, I'm not going okay. to. We already did the sweater day. So you don't I have to. No, you good. do whatever you want. I'm going to be relaxed tomorrow. And like Tank you top, said, we've got, we've got some special stuff. It's going to be great. So it's gonna- <laughs> Our hearts will be full. Uh, every Friday this week, it's on a Thursday. Our friends at Local Environmental Services, they, they pave the way, so to speak, for us to blow off a little steam. Uh, to, for you to say what you really mean, to use this platform to make sure everybody hears the perspective that otherwise may be stifled. It's a tradition we call trash talk. All right. This is a response to an email on bike lanes in last week's trash talk. That's right. Last week, it was Nils who had bike lanes and $100 million from Edmonton City Council in his sights. He was not happy. Well, this is point counterpoint from Stephen, who writes in to say, I've been wanting to write this email for weeks, but I just finished my finals for university yesterday, so I'm taking the chance to do it now. Big fuss being made over this $100 million for just bike lanes in Edmonton. Literally everybody's coverage of this story, Jesperson, is totally missing the point. It's $100 million to implement the city's bike plan. Holy shit, the bike plan is not just about bike lanes. It's about shared use pathways, bike boulevards, improved intersection design, and safer streets overall. I don't know about you, but that sounds light as fuck. 
This is an investment within our neighborhoods across the city for recreation and transportation options. Jesus Murphy, that goblin who sent in a trash talk submission last week lamenting the $100 million on bike infrastructure was so silly and goofy when he was like, the government will just force us to use horses and carriages. Newsflash, you silly and goofy goblin. The government basically forces us to drive everywhere because we don't have transportation options right now. Investing in transit and active transportation breaks us out of that cycle, you silly and goofy goblin. XOXO from Steven, who is the exclusive purveyor of Trash Talk today because we loved what you had to say. You can send us your Trash Talk anytime to talk at ryanjesperson.com. Proudly presented by Local Environmental Services, we're walking out of this show with a lot of energy, in part because of Sean Canungo, in part because of you, our real talkers, John, in part because of you and what you bring to the table. We love all of you guys, and we'll see you back back here early January, Tuesday the 3rd, live from the Real Talk studio. Happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and we'll celebrate more when we get back together. We'll see you soon. Real Talk is hosted by Ryan Jesperson. Executive Producer, Josh Dunford. Technical Producer, John Hicks. General Manager, Katie Cook-Chivers. Account Coordinator, Lawrence Durlego. Human Resources, Lena Shepherd. Website Design, Mike Johnston. VoiceOver by me, Perry Skelton. Real Talk's Editorial Board is Supriya Duvetti, Ahmed Ali, Brandi Morin, Ann Castleman, Corey Hogan, Harmon Candola, Catherine O'Neill, and Chris Henderson. Member Emerita, Julie Rohr. Real Talk is recorded in Edmonton, Alberta on Treaty 6 territory, the traditional and ancestral territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, and Nakota Sioux, home to the Métis settlements and the Métis Nation of Alberta. Real Talk is a relay project. For more, check out ryanjasperson.com.